Hey everybody, welcome to Permanente Docs Chat. I'm your host, Alex McDonald, as always. Um, I practice family and sports medicine here in Fontana, California, as part of the Southern California Permanente Medical Group. So thank you all for joining, tuning in, listening from wherever you may be today. Uh, I'm very excited for our guest today. I'm always very excited for our guest, but I'm very excited for this guest in particular. Uh, Dr. Toledo is a family physician at the Northwest Permanente uh, Medical Group, and we are here to discuss uh, climate change, the environment, and the impact on health uh, in advance of Earth Day, which is Sunday. Make sure you all mark your calendars. Um, so if you're listening live, please feel free to drop questions in the Q&A. We'll get to as many of those as we can. Um, but we're going to keep this high yield and efficient, and hopefully we get some good uh, good engagement here and some some good information too. So let's just jump right right in. So Dr. Toledo, thank you for joining us. Um, tell us, tell us who you are and, and what you do. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Anne Toledo. And as Dr. McDonald mentioned, I'm a family medicine doctor by training. And I practice urgent care medicine. I'm the chief of urgent care for the Northwest region. And I also practice hospital medicine. Great. So multiple hats like many of us, many of us do as well, too. So uh, I'm sure we'll have a slightly family medicine bias and primary care bias today. But I guess if we call it out and admit it, that's the that's the first step to solving your problem, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. So again, um, April 22nd is Earth Day. Um, and I really want to ask and chat about some of the, the health impacts um, that you've been seeing in your practice related to uh, to the climate and the environment and, and climate change as well, too. So um, tell us some of the things that you just have, have sort of personally been seeing in your practice. Yeah. So as mentioned, I work in the Northwest, but I think the important thing to hold, even though I'm going to talk about things that happen in the Northwest part of our country, the truth is climate change affects everyone. The world is getting hotter. There are more extreme events like floods and wildfires. Uh, there's higher risk of infectious diseases from water changes related to climate, um, as well as insect lifespan. So no matter where you live in the country and which region you're representing today, um, one of these things probably is impacting your patients. Mm -hmm. um, for me, uh, in the Northwest, you know, I think some of the most prominent effects that we've seen are greater extremes in weather. So mm -hmm. the world in general is getting hotter, and certainly we're seeing that in the Northwest uh, precipitation. So rain is changing. Um, and then we also see air pollution changing connected with those things. And so for my patients, especially in urgent care and acute care medicine, we see some very common effects. One, heat-related illness. So for longer periods of time and greater extremes of heat, we're seeing waves of temperature change that really disproportionately affect some vulnerable populations. Um, and then another area uh, that you touched on is wildfires, right? So extreme mm -hmm. events that happen like a fire or a flood, other parts of the country see hurricanes. Uh, that really impacts air quality. We see an enormous rise in emergency medicine visits, mm -hmm. and that in turn affects how other people are able to access care too. Yeah, that's such a great point when there's, you know, an, a 10 hour wait in the ER, um, that's not good for anybody as well too. And so um, that's certainly a really, a really good point too, that it, the, the ripple, the ripple downstream effects as well too. I mean, here in Southern California, we've been had more rain, I think, than we've had, you know, the past several years combined. And we've had issues with, with runoff and not being able to absorb water. Um, and, but, but still in a drought at the same time, it's because it could just the, the overall volume uh, in the aqueducts is, is low as well, too. So it's kind of a, it feels very odd and, and disproportionate at times as well, too. So something we're all, we're all sort of grappling with in any part of the country as well, too. Um, do you, do you talk to your patients about the environment and their health at all? Like, does this kind of come up organically? Does it kind of depend on, on what, what the patient's there for specifically? Yeah. Um, so I think that's, a that really gets into both how we respond in the moment when one of my patients is affected by climate change, mm -hmm. um, as well as if I'm trying to prepare someone for those risks. So mm -hmm. yes, you know, am I using the word climate change and giving a stump speech about, you know, how we as a system can fix it for every patient? No, but I don't think that's even necessary. And I think that feeling like one has to do that probably unnecessarily puts some clinicians off of talking about it, which is too bad. Um, so I sure. think, you know, the easy thing to do and what I do when I'm talking to patients about climate and their health is I'm thinking about, okay, in the now is something happening in our climate, like a poor air quality index mm -hmm. Do those patients who that's especially relevant to like people with COPD 
asthma, severe seasonal allergies, do they know how to look for that? Are they familiar with looking at those indexes, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then I'm talking to them about, well, what are you gonna do to prepare your health? Or if you notice more symptoms, what is our action plan for those things? And so, yeah. you know, the beauty of, you know, addressing climate change and health is all of you as listeners who are clinicians have the medical knowledge to care for people when they have these problems. Mm -hmm. And the only ad there is remembering to connect that for your patients to what's going on in their world around them because they might not be noticing that, right? And so same thing, I think um, for long-term planning for my patients, something else I think about is, well, you know, so you mentioned Southern California, right? So a huge problem that the West has are these wildfires, lots of mm -hmm. property damage and infrastructure damage, right? Or yeah. risk of electrical outing. And so talking with your patients, who have medical equipment that hinges on functioning electricity, right? Mm -hmm. Do you have insulin that needs to be refrigerated in this coming heat dome? Do you use a CPAP machine or another machine critical to your survival that needs electricity? Mm -hmm. Or do you have loved ones that you can check on and make sure they have a generator plan if something like that is coming? So I think there's both in the moment direct health to effects to people's health and there are these indirect pieces, which is how are you going to get to care if you have chest pain and there's a fire or there's a storm or flooding, right? How are you going to make sure you have access to electricity or clean food and water if part of that infrastructure is interrupted by something from climate change? Yeah, that's such a great that's such a great point in just sort of preparing and a little bit of anticipatory guidance on sort of the the what ifs and preparing for the worst case scenario. I feel like we're good at doing that with our pediatric population, but but some of our older, more chronic uh, illness patients, we we don't always sort of think about that preventative counseling as well too, because there's just so much <laughs> other things to talk about too. But that's a great point. One thing that I always, um, uh, I, obviously, as, as many of you know, I'm, I'm a big, I'm a huge proponent of physical activity and getting moving as a way to reverse disease as well as promote health. Um, and, and I often will give my patients a walking prescription. Um, and, and recently people say, well, it's too rainy. I don't want to walk. Or, or in the summer, it's too hot. I don't want to walk. Yeah. Or it's too cold. I don't want to walk. Um, and one of my go-tos is, well, have you heard of these mall walking groups? You can go go to a mall where there's indoor air, it's climate controlled. You can go get some physical activity with some friends. Um, and so sometimes uh, the environment and, and climate can can create barriers to kind of yeah. doing that preventative maintenance we need to do to keep ourselves healthy. Um, and so that's my, my most recent thing is I'm like, hey, you know, there's a mall walker group. They meet at 7 a.m. at X, Y, Z. Um, and so sometimes helping people sort of think about uh, different ways that they can, they can mitigate or get through some of these barriers, which are, which really do impact our health when it comes to, to climate change as well, too. That's my, that's my most recent one. I'll keep thinking of more. Don't worry. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that is what drives a lot of people up the wall when they're stuck inside, you know, because of particulate matter being really high, you know, in certain times in summer. Right. Um, and so it's great to offer to your patients here are some alternative ways you could still meet your needs and health, even when there are barriers related to climate. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you 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 already touched on this a lot too, but maybe just give you another opportunity. Are there any are there any specific recommendations you have for uh, uh, physicians and other clinicians about how to how to start to have that conversation with patients? Because unfortunately, there's sort of a lot of rhetoric and division around the issue and the science of climate yeah. change. Unfortunately, although there shouldn't be. Um, but yeah. so, do you have any recommendations for physicians who uh, who want to talk about these things but aren't sure how to start or how to engage the patients? Yeah, um, I actually, I, there's a couple ways we can approach this, I think. So uh, one, um, you know, I was just looking into this in advance of this talk, Alex, because I was wondering amongst medical professionals, what that lens is, and mm -hmm. I have good news. <laughs> so in a pretty recent survey of um, healthcare workers, on the whole, healthcare workers are pretty on board with climate change being something that impacts us all and is happening. Mm -hmm. The main area that people in medicine may disagree some is their understanding of how much of that is from human sources and how much of it isn't. Um, but sure. which, the answer is a lot. <laughs> um, spoiler alert. And um, so, yeah, I think, you know, when you're talking with your patients, right, I think what you're alluding to is, well, what if you are talking to a patient who, uh, you know, is new to this information, or disagrees and is triggered by this information. Uh, I think there are a couple helpful approaches to that. So one, all of our patients can agree that they have experienced natural disasters 
like extreme heat, mm-hmm. or they have been impacted by fire and property destruction or displacement, or they've dealt with flooding or notice they're getting tick bites more often in this, you know, shoulder seasons. Mm -hmm. So I think what I usually go to if someone, you know, if it's not, if I'm not getting very far around the topic of climate is honestly, that's okay. It doesn't matter what you call it. What you can say is it's important for me as a physician to protect my patients and our communities and their health. And what I know is that we're seeing more often events or environmental circumstances that are negatively affecting my patients. Mm -hmm. And I wanna help them with that. And so I think approaching the conversation that way can be helpful. Um, And, you know, I love what you're asking. You're also getting into, um, well, how, how does public health, how do physicians or NPs and PAs as clinicians think about what should the response be to climate change, right? Because there's that one-on-one individual piece in coaching. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I think sometimes, you know, tell me if I'm wrong here, but I think sometimes people hear climate change and they think about the whole planet and they think that's very big. I don't know how to fix that. That's huge and nebulous. And like, what am I as an individual going to do about this? Um, and so I think besides the patient counseling piece, the other piece of good news is that, large public health groups are moving much more toward what can communities and health Mm -hmm. systems do about climate change. And so, yes, there is the big piece of mitigation, right? How do we reduce greenhouse gases? And I'd love to talk about some of the ways healthcare systems do that. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's mitigation, but there is also modulation and adaptation. So it may be that our colleagues and our patients are able to participate in those latter two more than just individual action. If you're talking to someone and they're like, I don't like riding bikes, I don't want a mushy cardboard straw, then that doesn't have to be the end of the conversation. Um, and so, yeah, I'd love to talk a little bit about well, what does mid, you know, modulation and adaptation look like as a climate change response. Yeah, no, please tell me, tell me more. I mean, I want to know kind of what, what we can yeah. do individually um, and then what are, maybe what our, our health systems can do, what our hospitals can do. Um, and then also, you know, our public health departments as well, too. I mean, um, uh, the, the, just the amount of medical waste that we produce as a healthcare industry is kind yeah. of nauseating, quite frankly, um, especially during COVID when I'm changing gowns, every single patient room I go into, every time I took a gown off, I was like, oh, yeah. more waste, right? A lot yeah. of it's plastic. A lot of it's not biodegradable as well, too. So I think, um, again, thinking about this as, as individuals, but also health systems, as well as public health, too. Um, t- please go yeah. into more into the more of that details. I'd love to know. Definitely. Yeah, let's, let's talk about health systems. I'll give some examples about what we've been doing in the Northwest uh, and that other health systems work on. Uh, and then I'd love to talk about like public health and adaptation. There's a great role for that. Um, so, you know, from the mitigation part and a health system, right, you just talked about waste. Um, so I honestly, I had to look this up myself recently. Um, in the US, when you think about, okay, how much is the healthcare industry responsible for? I think we're talking around like eight to 10% of emissions, uh, which is a non-zero number. Right. So, you know, there are a num- there are a few things we can do. So some efforts include things like uh, making choices about uh, anesthetics, inhaled anesthetics that create lower emissions. And so that's something that the Northwest region was able to do um, and reduced emissions in a year by hundreds of tons of CO2, which is a big deal. That's like taking multiple cars off the road each year, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And the other beauty of a lot of these interventions, that strategy is actually less expensive to the tune of like $100,000 less per year. So I think people are also afraid sometimes, well, what if climate change strategies are also really expensive or it's hard to resource them? And I would say that is not necessarily the case. Um, And I think to your point about attire, organizations can put forward guidelines on what is the appropriate attire for each procedure type Mm -hmm. um, so that people don't overdo it or unwrap and waste a ton of things they don't need. Same thing with special equipment in operating rooms and custom packs for surgeons. That's another effort that's underway in the Northwest where they have it available. Of course, if you need it, it's there. And the message is, well, let's just wait to open this and contaminate it until we're sure that we're actually going to use this material, right? So 
Um, there, those are a few examples of a lot of things healthcare can do to mitigate. Um, but then I think for, you know, for the individual healthcare worker, there's a lot we can do to modulate and adapt, right? So one, we were talking about this a bit, helping people manage pre-existing health status, right? So climate change affects everyone. It does not affect everyone equally, right? So very young people, very elderly people with heart conditions or lung conditions, and definitely poorer people and communities of color are impacted more severely. Uh, and so working with your patients to help modulate those risks is a huge deal. Mm -hmm. um, and then similarly, um, like public health infrastructure, a lot of public health organizations by state have groups that you can join if you're an interested clinician to help communities develop their plan for if an extreme weather event happens. Yep. Um, and then finally, that emergency management and disaster preparedness, that is a great way people can adapt, right? So what are the plans we have to communicate to local people if they're at high risk of poor air quality in language and culturally appropriate terms? Um, what is our plan for, you know, helping the ERs um, be prepared for large surges in volume if there's a disaster? Mm -hmm. um, so I think those are a few of the ways that people can get involved. And then one other interesting thing, I was talking to my friend who worked in LA County in public health about this is public health groups need to know how big of a problem something is. So you and I as a doctor, um, when we're seeing a patient and we think that they are dehydrated and need to be in the hospital because they were in their apartment at 104 degrees with no air conditioner for several days, mm -hmm. coding heat exhaustion or heat stroke, because that is how public health finds out how big of a problem this is, right? Yeah. So remembering not just to code in the ER dehydration, if there's a climate related issue and there's a diagnosis for that, name it. There's all kinds of crazy ICD-10 ICD diagnoses, so I'm I'm sure that's something we could kind of explore a whole podcast in and of itself too. Yeah. Um, that's that's such a great uh, sort of great summary. So there was a question in the chat here, um, uh, which kind of dovetails nicely in that. If if you could just sort of pick one thing that that physicians can do or say to to help you know make the world a little bit safer uh, regarding climate and climate events what what i guess what's that one thing i don't i don't want to put you on the spot it sounds like there's lots of lots of things we can do but what's that maybe the one thing you you might put high top on that list i think one of the most direct things physicians can do is that resiliency piece with your patients so that's around the adaptation piece which is if you are a doctor and you know your patients and they are in those risky populations or they have a dependency on um, equipment, supplies, making sure that they have a plan and maybe your back office has a plan or you know that list of people in the case of Kaiser, it's easy for us to mm -hmm. have the system give us those lists, right? And thinking about how are we gonna outreach when there is a disaster like heat or fire or flood? How are we gonna help people be resilient in the face of this in terms of their health and being able to access the appropriate care using virtual medicine, using other check-ins or nurse check-ins. Um, and how are we gonna put mental health supports around them for that resiliency too, because it's traumatic to people. Yeah, no, that's a that's a great a great call out. I think one thing too regarding sort of preparation is looking look about joining your medical reserve corps. Yes. Um, so I'm a yes. member of, of our medical reserve corps here in San Bernardino County, um, and it's not a lot of time, but it's it's a great way to connect with other people who are interested in sort of disaster preparedness as well. So when there is you know, the, yes. the next event, uh, you know, we kind of have some, some infrastructure in place and you kind of know where to go or where to turn to, cause that can be a really, a really important piece too. So got to give a call out to our medical reserve corps across the, across the nation. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll send these along to your team as well after, but, um, there are a number of organizations specifically focused on climate and health nationally and locally that you can sign up for and connect with where you are who they're looking for. They need experts connected with the community to meet and give guidance. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
Well, let's let's talk a little bit more about our our patients, and you know, yeah. for our patients who are particularly interested in you know climate mitigation or or climate yeah. change, what what recommendations do you have for patients or different ways that they can get involved or they can learn more about you know their own uh, individual or their family impact on on climate and the environment as well? Yeah, um, so I think at for at the patient individual level still there is opportunity to engage with their communities, right? So as we all know, um, patients who live alone and have no connections at all suffer a great deal more, especially if they're critically ill than people who have good networks and supports. So I think one thing is building those networks of family or friends, or if they don't have that in the area, community groups, right? So encouraging them to have connections with people and someone who's gonna check on them is so important. Um, and then on an individual level, you know, there, there are a ton of great resources around, you know, how can you make sure that your home uh, has good cooling mechanisms in place or how can you get access to that if you are a cost limited person or family. Um, so I think, uh, again, you know, trying to modulate the risk in your own private home of harm coming to you that would cause you to have to go to the ER, right, mm -hmm. in the case of climate. So I think some of these things sound basic, but again, yes, you can definitely offset carbon emissions by choices you make and how you power your home and the type of energy you use. That's wonderful. But also, you know, being prepared and having a plan with you and your loved ones for how will you have access to clean water basics? Mm -hmm. How will you stay cool? Um, and who are the people in your community who need help planning that? And similarly, your community needs help messaging that. I think one of the biggest problems with public health and the greatest like public health failures in history around this are that the people who are going to be impacted and suffer don't get the message and the mm -hmm. warning and they don't have a chance to prepare. And so one of the most important things our patients can do, again, getting to community-wide, system-wide level is help develop those connections. If they're excited about climate and what they can do about it, joining a community group in their neighborhood that is helping educate being an outreach worker for their neighborhood around these issues so that people who know them and trust them uh, are aware that they have that knowledge and they're getting it out there when uh, climate change affects their group. Yeah, no, that's such a great, uh, such great uh, information and topics and ideas for for individuals as well, too. So uh, this is wonderful. Again, we could go on and on, but we're trying to keep this pretty short and high yield. So um, last question, and perhaps the most important question, what makes you most proud to be a Permanente physician? Oh, I mean, I think, you know, Permanente is helping, I think, lead lead the charge. Definitely in the Northwest, this is true, um, with efforts around environmental health and advocacy. And for years now have already been looking at how do we reduce emissions? How do we have a disaster preparedness plan that all of our team has access to, right? So I think one of the things that, um, that I'm so proud of is that Permanente I know many of my colleagues in this group are really passionate about this topic. And I know the people that lead my organization care a great deal and are looking at all the avenues within the healthcare industry that they can reduce emissions as well as modulate and adapt for when disasters occur. And so I'm so glad to be part of an organization that cares that much about this issue. Awesome. Well, well, thank you so much for joining us and, and sharing your expertise today and your insights. It's been very, really helpful. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me.